Hello, welcome to the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Kraft Analytics Group. My name is Maggie. I am a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it is my pleasure to introduce the next presentation, Measuring the Immeasurable, Solving Soccer Analytics Using Machine Learning and Computer Vision, presented by Stats Perform. Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Patrick Lucy, Chief Scientist from Stats Perform. Right, hello everyone. So, um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the current state of soccer analytics and things we're doing to solve uh, certain aspects of it using machine learning and computer vision. Uh, before I get started, you probably see that logo down the bottom there, Stats Perform. Uh, that may be new to you guys. Um, so, last July, something very special happened. Uh, Stats, based here in Chicago, or based here in the US, uh, we merged with Perform, we're based in the UK. So in terms of soccer, what that means is that brands like Opta, Opta Pro, Running Ball, Watching Bet, Omnisport, we're all part of one family. So when you consume sports data, especially soccer data, uh, whether it's media and tech, if you Google a score, ask Apple Siri, Amazon Alexa, uh, that data comes from us. Uh, all sports books use our data, uh, especially in team performance. So uh, a lot of teams use our Opta data, or whether it is our sport view tracking data, and some teams use our Running Ball data. And so... A lot of innovations has happened in soccer. Um, so back in 2012, so most of you would be familiar with expected goal value. I actually presented a paper here on expected goal value using tracking data back in 2015. Um, we've progressed a lot, and it's what we're very proud of. It, it's in the mainstream media now. So BBC Match of the Day, they use this, and it tells better stories. Uh, more recently, Amazon Prime used our live win probability model in their uh, OTT broadcasts in, um, in December. So again, as an AI group, we're very proud of that. Uh, tracking data in soccer has actually been available since 1999, okay? So it can legally drink here in the US. Um, so we've done a lot of good work with this. So we have passing models, our risk and reward. Uh, just with our event data, we've done a lot of stuff. So I'll talk about possession value. Uh, so Opta are pushing that out now. So our possession value can now evaluate every action during a possession that leads to a shot or a goal. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we were part of work uh, that did ghosting. So we did this for soccer and basketball. So what you're seeing here is red is the attacking team and blue is the defensive team. Yellow is the ball. Using our representation that I'm going to talk about a bit later, we can actually simulate how, how a, a specific defense can actually move. And more recently, we're actually looking at body pose. So if you go to our stand, we have some things on body pose. However, in terms of what needs to be done, there's still a lot to be done in terms of soccer analytics. Soccer is very, very complex. Um, it's 11 on 11. It's low scoring. It's continuous. And that makes it very difficult to analyze. So if you look at a sport like basketball, basketball's five on five. And it's very advanced in terms of the language that they use. They can discretize every event, every planned possession into this very high level language. But in terms of soccer, it's very di difficult to do that. Again, it's 11 on 11. We have players moving around and, and it's really hard to, to um, formulate um, you know, a description of this in a discrete way. And so I like to use the example of formation. Okay? So we all know what formation is. It is the pillar of analysis in soccer. Now, before the game, we know the lineup, and we can say, well, this is the canonical formation of this team. Now, that's very hard to measure. So when we have data during out the match, we actually can see, well, this is the average touch position. And this highlights the issue that we have in soccer. Players move, it's dynamic. It's very hard to quantify this very complex thing. But I'm going to show you how we, we, we've solved that. Uh, the second thing is, is the data coverage. It's a data problem. It's not that the fact that tracking data doesn't exist, it is that we just don't have uniform coverage across all leagues. So I don't think anyone will debate me in the fact that we're gonna have the best metrics using tracking data. However, in terms of coverage, so here in the US, the US sports, we're very lucky that basically we have one dominant league. We have the MLB, uh, NBA, NFL, NHL. So they have one entity that can have a league-wide deal and all the teams just have that data. So when you look about it, if you look at it in terms of soccer, in terms of the data coverage that we have, in terms of our F24 event feed, we cover 55 leagues. Okay, so we want to compare players across 55 leagues, and we don't have tracking data to do that. 
And the leagues that do have their tracking data, they're not going to share it with the other league. So, for example, I'm in the English Premier League. I want to bring in a player from the Bundesliga. I haven't got access to the Bundesliga deal uh, data. So in terms of making recruitment decisions using tracking data, I can't do that. So I have to use event data. I'm going to show you how we can do that. And the third thing is there has to be a shift from metrics. Okay? What I mean by that is sport is very complex, especially soccer and the same with basketball. So we have video, we have tracking data, we have events. Okay? That happens every day, every night there's a game happening. And so the software backend, the ETL, um, just kind of storing the video, the interactive interfaces, takes a lot. And what we're finding is that teams are actually wanting to build this tech stack. You know, there's a lot of maintenance and there's a lot of uh, cost associated with that. But really what teams should be doing is asking specific questions. They should be using a sports platform to ask those questions. And I'm going to show you our, um, our AI platform to enable teams to do that. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to go through three main things. So number one is using tracking data and interactive interfaces. I'm going to show you how you, we can solve some of the strategy problems. Uh, number two, I'm going to show you using our event data how we can help teams make better recruitment decisions, compare players, and also do simulation. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is the progression of computer vision. So very lucky, uh, in basketball, we're undertaking this very grandiose uh, goal of digitizing all college sports. We have an excellent relationship with the Orlando Magic, who are very forward thinking. And this is going to pervade all sport, collecting this deep data to make better decisions. And I'm going to talk about what we can do there and how it can apply to soccer. OK, so I really like to use this example. So this guy here, he's the Bill Belichick of English football. Okay, so it's Marcelo Bielsa. He's the uh, manager of Leeds uh, United. And so for those who, who remember this, so last uh, January 2019, he actually got caught, or his team got caught spying on Derby County. So Frank Lam Lampard was the manager there. And what followed was that uh, the next day he did this 70-minute presentation. He basically said, well, this is what we do in South America. I'm a professional. To do analysis, to break down teams in terms of strategy, what we do is that we, we have an upcoming team, we analyse all the games that they played, and we spend four hours doing that. And that four hours is basically doing these things, is analysing the formation, breaking it down in five-minute chunks, and also analysing all their set plays. We do that because that is professional behaviour. However, this is um, a shortcoming of the technology. You know, as Stats Performer, a technology company, we've let these teams down badly because they're still doing this. You know, they're spending all this time doing this very subjective, time-consuming things. Technology should be able to solve it. Now, the problem is, is that tracking data, you think, well, I have tracking data. Can't I just use the average position of the players? The answer is you can't because tracking data is noisy, okay? Players move around. So just say you take a half of tracking data, it's the same for basketball, and you have their identity and you plot it. This is what it looks like. It's this noise. When we actually, what we actually want to do is get the underlying structure. So we use an unsupervised method to actually learn the permutation. So the noise with tracking data is permutation. I'm not going to talk about the method here because I've done that over the last decade. We have 13 papers on this. Uh, you can go to our website and check it out. But what this enables us to do is do formation analysis. And so I'm going to show you our edge platform. Uh, we have the league-wide deal for the Serie A and the French League. I really like using the example of Inter Milan here. Inter Milan, they have Antonio Conte, they have a nice back three. So what we can do is say, well, this is their average position. Let us click on roll, which is uh, what we do for formation. Now we can see immediately they play with a back three. So it's a 3-5-2. We can also see how much a player is in a certain position. And then we can break it down in terms of the context. So what was their formation when they're attacking and also defending? Because we have these measurements here, we can actually plot that on the interface as well. We can see, well, what was the compactness? What was the team length? What was the deepest defender? And I can show that. Okay. So once what took 200 hours, we can do 30 seconds. And we can break it down at different contexts as well. So let me see the formation when there was a counterattack or when there was a build-up. Or what we can actually do too is say, well, what was the formation when a ball was in a certain location or across a certain time period? There are infinite queries that we can do here. 
You just cannot discretize it into these buckets. You need this interactive interface to do this. So this is a really good example of where machine learning as well as uh, interactive interfaces can enable domain experts such as coaches and analysts to get the answers to the questions that they have. So instead of spending 200 hours, they can do this less than a minute. And it's objective as well. So another thing to do is actually breaking down individual players. So we can look at a team in terms of a structural, you know, their formation, how their structure varies over the game. But also what we want to do is break down a single play. As I said, soccer is 11 on 11. We have all these motion paths. We see from the game on the weekend, Mbappe goes down the right-hand side. It's across to the back post. Now, if I was to query that, how many words would I need to use to describe that? You know, if I want to model all the players, their velocity, their position, their acceleration, the events, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. So why don't we have that as our language? And so the answer is we do. We have a visual-based language, and using our Edge platform, we can actually do this. So we can go to the game that happened on the weekend. So PSG won 4 nil. So what we can do is show the tracking data with the video. We have these timelines where we can give context. So if I know what's important during a match, I can immediately go there. And so during the build-up, you can imagine if you're a coach or an analyst, you can have our, um, so this is all web-based. I can see this play. You can see Mbappe go down the right and you go, well, stop. Tell me everything about that. How often have they done that? How often has that led to a shot? How often has that led to a goal? And so you see the system is thinking here. We can say, well, that happened in the, um, the French League 1,300 times, led to 100 shots and 30 goals. But also, we can show all the ranked list here of all the players. And so you can click on these and get the video immediately. Okay? So we can do this for soccer and basketball, but that's the power of having this platform. Machine learning and interactive interfaces allows us to answer these questions. The third thing here I'm going to show is our set play analysis. So 30% of goals come from set plays. Now, that's why they spend so much time doing analysis on there. And so what we have here, so Juventus in uh, the Serie A are leading goal scorers from corners. So what we can do is condition on in-swinging and out-swinging. We can say, well, okay, so on the back post, I want to see all the video of Juventus on the back post from the left-hand side there. Click of a button, I can surface all that video, create a playlist. Or what I can actually do is say, well, let's look at the right-hand side. I want to actually see the running patterns of these players. So these are things that you can't do before this. So with the tracking data, I can say, well, Cristiano Ronaldo, he starts at the back post there. He tends to run to the near post. So what happens when we have a shot from a corner? We say, well, Benucci is in there too. He starts from the back post, but then he makes a run to the back post. So again, at a click of a button, you can get this and cover this insight using tracking data and interactive interfaces. So we're really proud of that. So I think uh, we have a booth outside. If you actually want to demo the software, uh, Ben, product manager there, he can step you through it. Um, but we're really proud of what we've done. And um, you know, feel free to test it out. The second thing I'm going to talk about is how we can make better recruitment decisions using event data. Uh, so instead of me talking about it, I think it's best to use an example to highlight the problem. So fundamentally, the question is, how can we compare two players just using event data? So we like to use this example. So we have Roberto Firmino here, and we have the Bayern Munich striker, Robert Lindowski. In old language, they're called number nines as strikers. However, they're different. You know, they have different roles for their team. They play in two different leagues. You know, how can, the question is, how can we use event data to compare players? But also, as I highlighted before, it's very important to interact with it. So can we have features which are uh, interpretable, tunable, and interactive? And so, so the solution that we've come up with is to kind of build player and team attributes. And really, the way that we think about it and to describe a player is via these three big buckets. Number one, we want spatial attributes. Okay. The second thing is we want contextual attributes. So how do they fit into their team? But also, we want to know how good they are. Do they actually, can they execute a pass in a certain region? Can they actually get at the end of a corner from a certain area? And so using our event data, we can actually create these descriptors. And so just to highlight some of our uh, touch maps, I'm going to go in a bit more detail using that example before. But I'm going to highlight some of our um, team playing styles there. So what we can do with our event data is break it into these eight semantic 
uh, description, so counterattacks, high press crossing, um, and that way we can describe a possession via these semantic labels. Uh, we can go a step further by associating certain possession trajectories associated with these uh, playing styles as well. Um, a big thing that you know, the soccer community has done a really good job of is coming up with these expected metrics. So instead of having a zero or one you know, for a success, uh, failure or success for a pass or a shot, we can come up with these um, machine learning uh, classifiers to actually see where they are in that continuum. So we have, we, we have measures of quality in terms of these metrics, but also we can come up with these heat maps. So similar to what they do with baseball. You know, we want to see where a player is hot and cold in terms of not only their passing, but also how they finish. And we can do that for um, strikers, midfielders, and also uh, goalkeepers as well. Now, when we look at these spatial heat maps, so actually to do this, what you do is you get an occupancy map, and then we use non-negative matrix factorization, and we can break these factors. And what's really nice about this is that it's interpretable. So we can see that Lindowski, his most active factor is getting, receiving the ball on top of the 18-yard box there. Um, and he tends to generate around the goal. But when you look at uh, Firmino, he tends to drop deep. He tends to drop deep to the right to get the ball. And we can see this with their attributes in terms of playing style. So uh, the top one there for Firmino, the build-up, he tends to drop deep. He gets heavily involved in build-ups compared to Lindowski, where he actually doesn't. So again, this captures how they play, but also we can um, do this in an interpretable way. So as I mentioned before, we have these other measures of quality, such as risk and reward of passes. So here we just kind of highlight how we do this. It's just uh, an example saying, well, in certain areas of the pitch where um, there's no one around, you're more likely to, to, um, to make those passes. But as you get further up the pitch here, uh, they're, they're, they're more dangerous. So, um, so you're more likely to um, you know, not execute on that pass. Another thing that we have here I touched on before is our possession value. So as we see here, what this action of Lacazette did in this situation would only contribute 1% to um, creating a chance. But we can actually break plays down and now we can value all of these actions. Um, we can put this all together into these descriptors and we can come up with this really, really rich uh, description of each player. Um, and so what this leads to is we can now do some clustering. Now that we have the representation, we can do clustering and we can break these players down into these certain groups. So what we do is that uh, from this representation, we use GM, um, Gaussian mixture model clustering, actually break these into these kind of five super clusters. And then within that, we have 29 clusters, which we then break down to 19. And I'm just going to highlight some of these clusters here. So if we basically now have 19 types of roles in football that we've actually found from this event data. So in terms of these defensive player clusters, we've broken it down to these recyclers. So in the English Premier League, we have Dunk, um, who can, we, we can class as a recycler. Uh, in terms of the progressors, you know, Varane from, um, I think, Real Madrid, we can class him as one of those. So the director, if you look at the Premier League stats, so Virgil van Dijk, he has the most touches and most passes. We can class him as a director, and we can do this in an unsupervised way, you know, similar to John Stones and Jared Pico. In terms of outwide players, we can see, well, the caretakers, so Juan Bissaka, who's now at uh, Manchester United, we can class him as one of these players. In terms of risk takers from out wide, we can see that Michael Brighton can fit within that, um, within that category. As well as zone movers, we can see that Robertson from uh, Liverpool, we can class in, in, in terms of, of, of that uh, role. And playmakers, so we have um, Alexander Arnold from Liverpool, we can class him um, in, in, in that bracket. So in terms of middle players, um, you know, I'll talk about uh, Jorginho. Uh, later, so he's more of a conductor, and then we can see the dynamos. Um, you can think of Kante and Havertz there. So again, the idea here is if I'm doing recruitment and I'm going to show you how we can do this with software, if I have a certain player and I want to find a player like that, maybe at a different league, instantaneously I can find those players using our um, using our system. So in terms of attacking players, we can see that um, we can see that Messi and Firmino basically play a similar role. So just say Messi gets injured, maybe Barcelona may want to get Firmino. So it's around that. So, but how could you really replace Messi there? Um, in terms of strikers, we can see that Hazard and Sterling are in a similar bracket there. And um, the example that we showed before, Lind uh, Lindowski and, and Zabata around that same bracket. 
Now, how we use this in, in our software, and we're releasing this edge recruitment software very, very soon, the idea here is that, well, I'm Chelsea, I'm Jorginho. I want to find players, maybe seven players like Jorginho. Show them. But what we can see on the left there, we have these interpretable interactive features that I can slide, and depending on that query, I can surface those players. Or there could be different things that are, there could be different dials that I have, and it could be in terms of possession value. So I just may see, well, I want to find a player who brings me the biggest possession value, and you can start to choose players that way. And again, it's an assistive tool. You know, there are other attributes that go into this, but you can maybe check your gut or find players that you may not have thought, thought of, considering how big the world of football is and given how many leagues that we actually cover. Now, that's good. So we're very proud of that solution as well. Um, and so we can do these player comparisons, but what about simulation? And what I mean about simulation is if I bring a player in, can I simulate how they would perform in a certain situation? So the example that I like to use is from the Champions League a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not going to play this video. I think everyone probably knows what happens next. So we have Gareth Bale who shoots from 35 yards out, goes through Karras' hands. And what Liverpool did next was really interesting. So they got the checkbook out and they paid a lot of money to AS Roma. I think at the time it was a world record fee. They paid 60, 67 million pounds for uh, Alison Becker. And using this technology, we can actually see um, the idea behind these personalized predictions actually is with expected metrics, expected goal value or expected save value, what we're doing is seeing what the league average player would do in that situation. That's not really what we want. We want to know what that specific player will do in that situation. So given this shot, we can say, well, Karis, his likelihood of saving that is 95.5%. Allison is 96.5%. And the way that we do it is that we can actually come up with these spatial descriptors and personalize. And the, the power of this is that given that descriptor, not using their identity, but using these embeddings, we can put Allison in goal for Liverpool for that season and see how many goals they would have been better off. Using this approach, we can say, well, hey, Liverpool would have been seven goals better off. And so we've actually turned this into a metric. So I'm not sure if you followed the news that so Allison's out injured. Uh, so he'll miss three games and he'll have his replacement. We can actually start to simulate what his replacement would have in, in terms of expected uh, save value there. And using this, we've actually come up with our goalkeeper rating. So ESPN actually surfaced this uh, before the Champions League final last year. And if you go to statscoreindex.com, you can actually find our most recent ratings. So the intuition with the rating here is that we can simulate each player against every shot in that league, okay? And now we can average it uh, to the league, the, the league average and see how many goals per game a goalkeeper would have been better off. So we can see that Allison is dominating the English Premier League. For La Liga, we can see um, that, that Jan Oblak, he's not number one, he's actually number two. Um, in the Bundesliga, so we can see Trapp is the leading goalkeeper there. Um, in Serie A, we can see the Juventus goalkeeper is leading. And then um, in terms of League One, we can see Ruli is now the best goalkeeper. And so we update that every week. You can go to that website and you can, you can find our simulation there. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, again, we have really nice solutions using our event data, but we want tracking data from every game that's being played. And so, as I mentioned before, we have an excellent relationship with the Orlando Magic. Again, they're very forward thinking. They know how they want to use this data. It's up for us to collect that data. Um, and our goal for all sports is to make, uh, so given our footprint and tracking data, it's really small when you think about where all the video is. So if you go back in time, back uh, from every game that's being played, we have all this video, but we haven't got any tracking data for it. Our goal is using our technology is to actually match what we have video for with tracking data. So that's our goal as a company to get to that point. And so computer vision has come a long way and um, you know, using body pose detection, using advances in calibration, we can actually start to track every action, every player and every frame. And the reason why we use body pose here is that it's the best detector out there. Okay, we don't, use, we don't use bounding boxes. Bounding boxes aren't good enough. We need to use skeletons there to do that. And the really nice thing here is that we can go back in time. And so we can go back to um, these English Premier League classics and then we can go back and compare, say, maybe Thierry Henry to um, maybe Firmino. You know, we can do those comparisons now. And as I said before, we, we're doing this for basketball. And the thing is, you can do a prototype. You can get it working once for a two-minute clip. 
But doing this for five, 10,000 games, that's tough. That's really tough, and this is what we're embarking on. And so we're doing this for basketball. Um, it's been a great journey, and we're doing this for soccer as well. We started doing this for soccer. But doing this at scale, dealing with all the edge cases, this is a really tough stuff in AI. And this is, as a group, this is what we're investing in. And this can lead us to all sorts of nice applications. It's not just collecting tracking data. I showed these nice interactive interfaces, but why can't we just interact with the video itself? Okay, I'm watching video, especially as we're going to over the top, OTT. Why can't I interact with the video directly? And so this is what we can start to do now. So this is out of our innovation group. And what we're able to show here is that we have all the information. So using our AutoStats approach, we can actually start to surface all the information on the actual video. I should be able to click on any player there. I can come up just where their basic stats or their really advanced stats. I should be able to do visual search. I should be able to do all these things. And so you can think about it coming full circle. We have all this information here. Video is a kernel of all knowledge. We should be able to embed that and, and lead to these interactive questions and just allow anyone to answer whatever question that they want whenever they want. Um, so, so that's the overall vision there. So that's it. So um, just to summarize, so we've doing a lot of great stuff with um, strategy analysis using our tracking data. Uh, we can use event data to come up with better recruitment decisions there, but ultimately what we want to do is put that all into the video and using our AutoStats technology with smart interactive interfaces and machine learning, we can do that. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this technology, you can go to our websites. We do have a booth outside and, and the team here would be more than happy to, um, to address any questions that you have. So I appreciate your attention. Um, I'll be around for the next day and a half, so I'll be happy to answer any questions there. So thank you very much.